We're going to be in the book of John, and we're going to start in uh, chapter number three. I'm still following the, the same thought that I've been looking at some on the Wednesday evenings of uh, followers, uh, the early followers of Christ. And we come to, to this, uh, we, we've looked at these followers, and we've seen uh, mostly what we've looked at we would call the disciples. And a, as we've talked about them, the disciples, the apostles, uh, these are men that we would hold up and say, these are men that we would want to be like. These men had been searching for the Messiah. When they found the Messiah, they went and they told others, said, come and see. We found the Christ. We found the one that the Scripture has been looking for. And they invited others to come. And uh, we, we looked at the results of that. Uh, they told, told folks that, that uh, come and check out, see if this is not who the Scripture said would come. And they were thoroughly convinced that Jesus was indeed the Christ. Uh, there were no doubts. We looked at some of these men. They left their homes. We looked at Matthew last week. We saw he even left his occupation so that he would follow Christ. And so as we, we look at these, we, we're finding men that we would say have a clear devotion and, a, and are thoroughly convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, we like to hear those kind of stories. I... I I, I, read, uh, well, I, I read this on the Voice of the Martyrs page. They, they recorded it. And uh, they titled this, Her Last Prayer. She was only 16 or 17 years old. The place was Asia. The time was the 1970s. The communist soldiers had discovered their illegal Bible study. As the pastor was reading from the Bible, men with guns suddenly broke into the home, terrorizing the believers who gathered there to worship. The communists shouted insults and threatened to kill the Christians. The leading officer pointed his gun at the pastor's head. Hand me your Bible, he demanded. Reluctantly, the pastor handed over his Bible. It was his prized possession. With a sneer on his face, the guard threw the word of God on the floor at his feet. He glared at the small congregation. and said, we will let you go, but first you must spit on this book of lies. Anyone who refuses will be shot. The believers had no choice but to obey the officer's order. So the soldier pointed his gun at one of the men. He said, you're first. The man slowly got up and knelt down by the Bible, and reluctantly he spit on it, praying, Father, please forgive me. He stood up and walked out the door. Okay, you, the soldier said, nudging a woman. And this woman in tears could barely do what she was demanded. She only spit just a little bit, but it was just enough, and she was allowed to leave. But then quietly, a young girl came forward. Overcome with love for the Lord, she knelt down, picked up the Bible. She wiped off the spit with her dress. What have they done to your word? Please forgive them, she prayed. And then the soldier put the pistol to her head, and pulled the trigger. You know, we, we like to say, well, we had no choice. We had to do this. It, it, it cost too much. But we, as followers of Jesus Christ, need to be fully devoted followers. This is not a time for half-hearted Christianity. And as I read this, it's the 1970s, the communist threat. Couldn't we easily say the Muslim terrorists broke in upon the church. It's not that far-fetched. It's not that hard to see that this could happen in our day. And you and I need to make a decision now that we are going to be full-fledged Christians, fully devoted to God, no matter what the cost. And we need to make that stand. We don't have to do it in an a abusive, obtrusive way, but we need to be determined to follow after Christ. And so we're, we're inspired by those kind of stories. This evening, we're going to read about a man everyone in this congregation knows, but maybe you really don't. We find him in John chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 1. Here the scripture says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. 
Now, as we look at this, I want you to think about this man named Nicodemus. Now, to be fair, everything we know about Nicodemus is recorded for us in the book of John. And we're going to look at all of the passages that deal with Nicodemus, and you'll find out we know very little about this man, Nicodemus. But as we do look at these things, we, we see his faith is increasing maybe as he goes along, but we have no idea what becomes of Nicodemus through scriptures after we, we finish reading in John 19 this evening. And uh, most commentators believe that he becomes a true disciple, but it's just speculation and supposition. We don't really know. And, and as we look at this this evening, think of what a shame it would be to live on this earth, and when you're gone from it, nobody really knows if you're a true believer in Christ or not. We cannot be half-hearted in our devotion and in our uh, Christianity. We, we need to be full-fledged Christian. So it's a very interesting interesting uh, note here. He, he comes to Christ by night. There's a lot of speculation. Why night? Well, he's a, a Pharisee. He's, he's one of the leaders of rulers. Uh, so it could be that he's very busy during the day, and he just had this opportunity at night. It could be Jesus, very busy during the day, and he thinks it's a better chance for him to meet with Christ at night. But most scholars think that Nicodemus comes to Christ at night so that he is least likely to be recognized. Now, we can't, can't prove that. This is speculation. But, but think, about, think about how other people have come to Christ. The poor come in the daylight. The sinners, full-fledged, they know it, come in the daylight. And yet, when do the rich and when do the religious come and seek Christ? They seek him in the dark. It's, a, it's an interesting contrast to think about. You know, when I don't know how it is when you came to Christ. Maybe you were timid about it as well. Maybe you didn't want your friends to know that, hey, I'm going to this, this church and they preach about Jesus and they believe the Bible and they believe the things that the Bible teaches. And uh, maybe you didn't want to be labeled one of those fanatic and one of those wackos. Uh, but as you grow in Christ, you recognize that this is the truth. And, and then you stay with it. Uh, so we don't know. Uh, possibly, though, Nicodemus didn't want others to know that he was visiting Christ. He comes to visit Christ, and he visits him on the feast of the Passover. Um, it, that would have really been something. I mean, it's, it's bad enough you go to that church, but you go at this time of year. It, that's, that's the implication. It's bad enough that you want to hear about Jesus. But you're going to go and hear about Jesus during the feast of the Passover? Well, Nicodemus, that's way over the top. I mean, that's, that's turning your back on the high holy days of Judaism and of everything the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the Levites, that everyone believes. And you're going to go and see Jesus. It, it could be that's another reason that he goes at night. But with those difficulties, isn't it a great thing? to see that Nicodemus still says, I want to go and see Christ. See, we, we want to get hung up that somebody doesn't come to Christ exactly like we would, or just uh, they should have just come jumping down the aisle, leaping and, you know, look, jumping for joy. Well, let's just be thankful that people get saved, that people are seeking Christ, that, uh, and let's not get so wrapped up, and they didn't really cry enough. Uh, they didn't really seem like, like they were emotional enough. Uh, at least Nicodemus comes. But, but he comes, and as we see through this, it, it's rather half-hearted. Uh, look at the confession he makes. He says, uh, he calls Jesus rabbi. Now that is a term of respect. Because Nicodemus would have been one that was called rabbi himself. So when he says this, he's not just saying sir or just being polite to Jesus. He's giving Jesus the re some respect and and when he talks to Jesus and he says to him rabbi we know that thou art a teacher come from God when when I use the term we I, I tell my folks this at the office when I say we sometimes that doesn't include me 
it means you guys are going to go do something, and then I just take credit for it, right? I, I'm the supervisor. So we, we do these things. But when, when Nicodemus says, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, who is he talking about? Who is the we? It's the rulers. It's the Pharisees. It's all of this group. As they look at what Jesus is doing, they have some very uh, blunt, open conversations amongst themselves they're not going to admit it out to the world that jesus is from god but when they look at everything that jesus is doing they say we know that thou art a teacher come from god for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except god be with him so it is impossible for a man to do this this is not some charlatan this is not parlor tricks you we know that you have come from god uh now they don't like that they hate christ for it but can you imagine those words coming out of Nicodemus' lips? It might almost shock him. And again, I go back to maybe when you came to Christ. You know, there's a lot of things that we say uh, before we come to Christ. Well, I'll never go to church. I don't need a Bible. I don't care what those preachers say. Well, those, those, those songs, the, those people, right? We got all of these opinions. And then you're sitting here in church and you're reading the scriptures, and you're saying those prayers, and you're singing those songs, they're coming out of your own lips, you're hearing your own voice in your own head speak those words. This is a major point for Nicodemus, because who would have ever thought Nicodemus would say, Jesus, you're a rabbi, and we know that you come from God. It's, it's an amazing thing. So he, he's made some progress. But the Lord challenges him to go even farther. Look in verse number 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Now, as we, as we look at this, Jesus is answering a question that Nicodemus hasn't even spoken. Nicodemus didn't say, how do I get to heaven? How do I enter the kingdom of God? He, he just comes in, he says, Rabbi. And Jesus answers the question that, Nicod that was on Nicodemus' mind. He did the same for you and I. You, you remember coming to that church service or wherever you happened to be sitting and the uh, somebody's knocked at your door and come in and presented the gospel and showed you how you could get saved. And you weren't thinking about, how do I get saved? But God answers the question that most needs to be answered. And, and this is the case here. Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, how can I? I'm an old man. Can I, can I go back and, and be born of my mother's womb? It's physically, it's impossible. I cannot do what, what you've asked to do. And see, the Jews had this, uh, this uh, teaching, a philosophy of a new birth. But it was all in the physical. And here's what they, they believed. Because they were born of the seed of Abraham, they were fine. You know, there's a lot of people that think because they're born in America, that they're fine, they're Christian. 
you cannot, it's not being born of the flesh. It's being born of the spirit and of the water is, is what Christ says. And, and he's telling us we have to be born spiritually. When you're born physically, you're born into a kingdom, a, a, a realm. You are born into a family. You have parents. Uh, you have extended family. Grandparents already came of there. Cousins are already there. Aunts, uncles are already there. You have a community and you have a state or a nation. Well, the same is true of the spiritual birth. And this is what the, the Lord tells him. Uh, he says, uh, uh, Nicodemus kind of gets lost in this. He says, how, how can I be born again? It, it's all in the flesh. And he's trying to work his way into heaven. Isn't that what we see a lot of today? People say, well, what, what can I do that I can be saved? And Jesus says, you must be born again, taking you out of the equation because you can't do it. It's all on his work. And to be born in a way Jesus is speaking of has nothing to do with physical. It's all spiritual. And when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are born again. You are born into a kingdom the kingdom of God. You have spiritual mother and father. Think of, of growing up. Somebody had posted on, on my Facebook today. You, you guys know I'm 49 years old today. And somebody posted on there that I was the, the world's greatest youth pastor. And I'm sure that uh, made somebody, uh, somebody's hackles go up because they thought they were the greatest youth pastor. But it was me. I have, I have somebody that said it. But, but think about uh, as kids are growing up, and you have the chance to influence them. When you're working in the Sunday school, or when you're working back here with the teenagers and uh, working with the adults and doing all of the different things that we do, do you realize you are seen as a spiritual mother or a spiritual father to a new Christian? Do you realize that you're, we use the term brother and sister, we, we have spiritual family. This church is a spiritual community. And we are born of the Spirit into a kingdom, into a family, into communion with one another. And it is the Spirit that makes it possible for us to be reborn, and it is the Spirit that keeps us going. Somebody said, how does that work? Jesus says, the wind comes, and you hear it. You see the effects of it, but you don't really know where it comes from or where it goes to. Same is true of the Spirit of God. But if you have the Spirit of God, there are effects. You see the trees waving, you see the flags waving. If the Spirit of God, if you've been born of the Spirit, that Spirit is the breath of God, the wind blowing through your life, then there will be evidences that you are born of the Spirit. See, when you're reborn, old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. The things you used to do, you're not going to do those anymore because the Holy Spirit's going to say, that's not right. We're going to walk away from sin. We're going to walk toward God. We're being pushed along, following the path that God has laid out for us. So there's evidence there. It's the same in the physical life. Uh, if you look with me in John chapter number 7, John chapter number 7, we're going to look at the second encounter uh, that we have with this man, Nicodemus. John chapter 7, verse 45. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and he said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed upon him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night being one of them, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? They answered and said to him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went into his own house. 
So there's a growing crisis as Christ has uh, continued on. He's gaining support. There are, are followers around and he's preaching in the synagogue and the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sanhedrin. They hate Christ and they're looking to put him to death and they send the temple guard to go and get him. And the temple guard comes back without Christ and they say, where is he? Why haven't you brought him? And the temple guard say, never a man spoke like this. Now, they went to Jesus with weapons, but when they heard the word of God, they couldn't take him. There, there was nothing for them. They, they could not apprehend. They, they said, this is not some man. This is not this uh, lunatic. This is not some crazy person. No man has ever spake like this man. Wouldn't it have been something to hear the word of God? but he's preserved it for you and I. The Holy Spirit will take these very words and seal them into our hearts and speak them in our minds, and we are hearing from the Word of God. Never a man spake like this. Don't follow a preacher. Follow the Word of God. Follow after, after Christ. And so uh, they, they want to uh, uh, take Christ, but these uh, temple guards come back and they haven't done it. And they, they said, you're, you're, all, you're, you're all just deceived. This whole people, they don't know the law. You're all just accursed. And then we find Nicodemus in their midst. But the Pharisees said, have any of us, have any of the rulers believed upon Christ? Thinking that the answer is no. Because if Nicodemus has believed in Christ, he hasn't bothered to tell them. Now, Nicodemus speaks up, but isn't this a half-hearted defense? He says, do we judge someone before we've heard them? He didn't say, listen, guys, I went and I spoke with Jesus personally. I sat down and he talked with me and he showed me that I was a sinner. He showed me the ways of God. He showed me this, uh, this thought of the rebirth. He didn't say a word. He sat there like he was one of them, not a believer a half-hearted follower of Christ. He's interested in Christ, but not so much that he's going to take a stand, not so much that it's going to interfere with his life or his livelihood. He wants just what I used to tell people is a lot of Christianity in America, we want just enough Jesus so we can sleep at night. Right? We use him like a sleeping pill just to knock off the guilt just so we don't feel so bad about ourselves. That's not being a Christian. Being a Christian is fully devoted to the cause of Christ. So he offers up this half-hearted defense, and he gives no other. Look down in John chapter number 19. <coughs> Sorry, John 19. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about a hundred pound weight. Then they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. This is the last record we have of Nicodemus. And did you see who he's with? Another secret follower of Christ. Someone who's afraid to say, I'm a follower of Christ, didn't want the repercussions of the Jews to come down upon him. Another reason that there's... It's just a sad testimony that Nicodemus kept his faith in Christ quiet. Now, now when you think of Joseph of Arimathea, he, he did uh, take and he, he uh, works and puts uh, effort toward Christ and taking care of the body of Christ. Uh, Nicodemus buys this great amount of perfume and they prepare the body and they, they do show that they have some care and some compassion for Christ. Maybe it's gone a little bit further than what we've seen earlier 
but we never read any more in scriptures about a man named Nicodemus. We don't read about him in the book of Acts leading a church. We, we don't read about him going out on missions. We have no idea what becomes of Nicodemus. A, a terrible, terrible testimony. Did he ever move beyond believing Jesus was a good teacher? I, I've seen some things that some atheists are putting up, uh, uh, you know, for Christmas, skip church, just be good. Well, you know, you can be good, but that's not going to get you to heaven. And let's be honest, come to church isn't going to get you to heaven. It's when you become a follower of Jesus Christ. You've got to go beyond believing that Jesus taught some good things, that Jesus has said some good things. Jesus is not just a good teacher. Jesus is the Christ. He is the sacrifice for your sins and my sins. And if we don't believe that, we have not been born again. Born of the Spirit. I, I wonder if Nicodemus come back to the grave and saw those grave clothes that he wrapped Christ in. Smelled it and it's the, the perfume of the myrrh that he had purchased and prepared the body with. I mean, it is possible Nicodemus becomes a full, uh, devoted follower of Jesus Christ, but we have no record of it. So what about you? I find it quite troubling, and I, I believe probably uh, in our nation today, we have a whole lot more half-hearted followers of Christ than we do fully devoted. And I don't know if you'd examine your own life. It's not my place to say whether you're fully devoted or half-hearted because let's be honest, every one of us can pick on something in somebody else's life. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to examine your own life. Are you fully devoted to following Christ? Or are you just half-hearted? The early followers of Christ were fully devoted. They gave up their jobs, gave up their homes. They left all to follow Christ. That's what a true disciple is. That's what Christianity is about. And I would challenge you uh, this week to think about how you can follow Christ in such a way that when others see it, they'll know that you are fully devoted and it's not just a part-time uh, or a half-hearted occupation.